the the fawn color. Um, so it's really fun to see this phenomenon. And the, my source at California Department of Fish and Wildlife tells me that there is a buck with a recessive gene for this fawn um, color. Um, so it's really fun to see this phenomenon. And the, my source at California Department. Of I'm Fish hearing Wildlife. myself talk. I'm hearing the recording, Peggy. Recessive gene for this fawn um, color. Okay, um, you know what it is? So it's the YouTube it's sound. Really Let me turn that off. Fun to see this. Okay, there you go. All right. Well, it's kind of hard to hear myself talking while I'm trying to talk. <laughs> so, um, so the buck with the recessive re gene. Right. He's the one that's, that's going around and impregnating the, the does with this possibility. And we know we have a, a mature doe on the sea ranch who is lighter, much lighter in color than uh, the others in the herd. And we think she was one of the former white fawns. So it's real fun to see this little, it's seeing it, because uh, I've only seen one once, uh, but seeing it in the wild is, is magical. I mean, a white fawn, come on, how cool is that? <laughs> I think it's pretty cool, uh, especially if you're a predator, <laughs> you probably really like it. Well, now, now you're going down and dirty. <laughs> my my no, other um, exciting news is that uh, yesterday, my, in quotes, my osprey chicks fledged. Great. And pretty exciting. A lot of calling in the air and they're out. I couldn't see this morning because it was shrouded in fog. So I'll, I'll have to wait till the fog pulls further back because they are closer to the shore. And uh, there was a lot of activity. My neighbor, Karen Tracy said, I'm hearing all kinds of osprey call. And I said, that's because the chicks just fledged. And there were two of them this year. And um, they look so healthy. The parents are so devoted. I mean, think about it with the ospreys. They have to, the osprey mother has to be on guard all the time against the ravens. And she, it, it was interesting for me to watch the, the, the male, the father does all the fishing for his mate and then for the chicks when they hatch. And the mother takes the fish from the, the father and she'll rip it into smaller pieces and she'll feed the babies. And then every now and then she'll feed herself and then back to feeding her chicks. And I saw one time the father came to the nest and he had a big stick. And I think we talked about this last time. It was interesting to watch him weave it into the nest. So she was able to relax while he was there. And I, and I saw her stop looking around. Her head's like on a swivel when she's on alert. And as soon as the male left, she was back on alert again. So a constant state of alertness and tending to the chicks. So now the chicks are going to have to learn to uh, feed themselves. So there'll be this time where the, where the chicks are begging to be fed and the mother will start weaning them away from her feeding them fish. And they, they're not gonna be too happy with it. So there's gonna be complaints. <laughs> well, you know, I, I have a question for you. Now, I saw a small bird fledge once, you know, from not too high a tree, maybe a, maybe even a high bush or something. And uh, it was so awkward. It was at first I thought it was a leaf. It was just kind of, you know, going down so awkwardly. And then it hit the ground and realized it was a, a small bird. So how is it for the ospreys? Because they're pretty high up. Do they... Um, eventually just stay a flight or do they just go on down to the earth? No, so they, what I've, what I've observed over the years, because I've been watching this nest that Rick and I've had in our view for 15 years is that they start exercising their wings on the edge of the nest. And so I can see them flapping their wings and they're exercising, getting their muscles ready. And then they'll start to do little hopping flights where they go from one side of the edge to the other and they'll momentarily be in the air. So um, I've, I saw one year, I saw one chick fledge and the other one was too afraid to do it. And he, he or she just was in the nest for some days afterwards and finally took the plunge. And what I actually saw that chick leave the nest. And so they, they, they fall down, you know, I mean, they, they definitely go down and then nature takes over, instinct takes over plus the work that I saw them do exercising their wings. But you're right, it's, it's, they're, fly, they're learning to fly. And sometimes the flying lessons can go a little awry. Um, <laughs> Ron, Ron Bolander photographed uh, three fledgling peregrine falcons down at Wallala Point Park. And two of them seemed to be doing really well, but one of them <laughs> was, was seemed to be very surprised when it landed in a bush. 
So <laughs> it, it can happen. And one of my favorite photos that someone sent in was of a Stellar J chick fledgling that obviously had just fledged and it, it uh, was holding on for dear life on a screen. It, so it, it didn't do too well for us exactly. Peggy's got, Peggy's got the look of what that, that uh, chick looked like. Pretty funny. Oh, wow. Isn't that, that's interesting. That is so great. You get to watch those uh, year after year. And, and now, so after they fledged, they, are they on their own or do they keep coming back to the nest? They, the ospreys come back to the nest to rest and uh, they, they will come back for some weeks. And then the, the parents will leave around the first day of autumn and the chicks will follow in a few days. So we get them from the first of spring. They were early this year. So perhaps they'll leave early this year. That's to be determined, but uh, this is their home. And the same nest is used over and over again. It gets bigger every year as they are more accomplished nest builders. They've got a learning curve too. The, the first couple of years, the nest blew down in the winter. So um, it's, it's real fun to see this process. And it's a privilege. I, I feel like it's a privilege to be able to watch it. And this year I had something uh, that really brought me joy also. Uh, violet green swallows nested in a nesting box that Rick put up some years ago. And even though we have cheap rent, really cheap rent, get it, Peggy? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, we didn't get any takers. We put it under the top eave of our house. But this year, two violet green swallows came and um, they're still, the chicks are still in the nest. I thought they had fledged, but they're still in the nest. I don't have any experience watching them before. So uh, I don't know that they come back to the nest, the, the swallows, I don't think they do. Um, but then on the other hand, I also have had pygmy nuthatches in abundance this year, four clutches that I know of in two separate birdhouses. And one of them is outside the bedroom window. And I can hear them in the morning as they start to get up. And I've been posting, <laughs> I've been posting videos of this event because it's so charming. Maybe you've seen it. I posted on Facebook, but yesterday I did a post on my website, blog, uh, mendanomasightings.com. So anyone can go see it. A video of me uh, videoing the nuthatches leaving at dawn. So they're it's right around 6 a.m., they were a little late this morning because of the fog. I think it kind of confused them, um, but it's fun to count how many are in this small birdhouse. And I'll, I'll, give, I'll give your listeners a heads up. There are eight of them in there. And the first one comes to the nesting hole. I, I, I think it's the father, I don't know, maybe the mother. And do they have six offspring? I'm not sure. I've learned yesterday that um, pygmy nuthatches raised their families in in groups, not like the osprey where it's just the mother and father and the, the chicks, other adult pygmy nuthatches are involved with raising uh, their chicks. So as we know they travel in big flocks, they're very communal is the word I'm thinking. Uh, so I asked this ornithologist, Robert Kiefer and Diane Hitchua, another uh, noted ornithologist, if they knew if pygmy nuthatches came back to the nest. And because I wondered if I had a whole nother clutch in there and they were fledging the first time it happened about two weeks ago and neither one of them knew. So it's fun for me to be able to contribute to their knowledge. Also, pygmy nut hatches do come back to the nesting box and overnight. I haven't seen them come in in the evening, but I sure see them every morning leaving. So I will be um, chronicling how long they stay in that box. Now, am, am I, I correct when I think of nut hatches? I mean, they're certainly small, but don't they kind of travel upside down on trees? They do. They do. It's, it's one of the charming things about the nut hatches and the pygmies are the smaller, as you might guess from their name. And they're very, um, they talk a lot. You, you maybe don't pick up on it, but um, I wanted to talk about that new uh, Merlin bird ID app that's out now and free from the folks at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, but on their website, as I was doing a little research for my post yesterday, it said that you perhaps don't pay attention to their calls because they're, they're kind of murmuring calls. It's kind of a, a something almost like the wind. Do you pay attention to the sound of the wind? It's just there. So I thought that that was interesting. But yes, I did want to tell your, your listeners about the Merlin Bird ID app. For, it's for smartphones. It's what I have been waiting for and asking for for years because 
you hear birds in the trees, but you don't see them. So right. this app will allow you to hold your phone up. The phone has, has microphones to hear the birds and it will identify the birds for you. It will flash with a picture of the bird and the name of the bird. And then you can click on it for further information. And I am having a blast with it. It's so much fun. I'm Are looking, looking at, right now. I am. You see me looking at my phone, Merlin Bird app, and it's free, of course. Hey, that sounds great. I am going to do that because, you know, you do. You hear these birds. And uh, Diane Hitchwa has, uh, she identified a bird for us, but it was interesting um, how she described the bird song mm-hmm. or sound. You know, it's very, everybody has, well, I mean, we're humans. It's hard right. to describe something as it's scratching is it murmuring you know which really doesn't tell us much right right like my dad could mimic bird songs really well but uh i certainly can't do that and i don't know no. what to do how cool merlin and you just so everybody it's whatever phone you have you can download it for free that's it's just so much fun i've been ha- i've been putting the app on while i take my walk and it with it and, and the bird song in the early mornings at dawn or it's the hour after dawn is the best time to listen for birds. And but what I've had happen with me as I'm walking along with my phone in one hand and my walking stick in the other is that it a bird will flash on the sound will happen that it will flash on my phone and I have a chance to see the bird. And I got to see a sapsucker the other day because my Merlin app picked up on the call. And I looked in that tree and I saw it. So it, it, it's really a, a fun adjunct to our, our love of hiking and being in nature and being able to experience what kind of birds are out there with us. Well, I'm just going to show this because, oh, but I'm blurred. I keep doing that. I did that yesterday. <laughs> I blurred my background. Um, hmm. Anyway, uh, we'll, we'll post a photo of it on uh, Facebook or, or yeah, maybe at the Merlin app and, and then people will know that they're downloading the right one. Right. Put a link on there. That would be great. If you, the link is on my website, also on Craig Tooley's Pileated Woodpecker post. So, uh, or you can just put uh, Merlin bird app in the search engine if that's easier for you. Uh, but it's what a, what a wonderful thing the folks at Cornell Lab of Ornithology did for us. It's just, I remember asking birder Rich Keen some years ago, isn't there an app that will tell me what the bird calls are? And he says, nope, sorry. So we now have it. We now have it. Well, it's so cool because we have uh, these apps for flowers, for the birds. Uh, I'm, I can't, and of course, there's several different types for flowers and, uh, and different things for birds as well. Bird song and other ways is to identify. I love those. They're so yeah, much fun. Yeah. Remember, it, we all used to carry around, not we all, but a lot of people carried the big books, right? The big guide books to help you, but you'd have to be fast to look up anything or have a good memory. Yeah. It's a real tool that we have now in our pockets. It's just wonderful. So, um, and I think it's a great thing for kids. I, as soon as I uh, found out about the app, I sent it to family members that have young children at home and they put it immediately on their phones. So I think it's going to open up a, a whole world to, to uh, people that may not have been interested before. So it's, it's great, it's really great. I, I mentioned Ron Bolander and uh, I had the pleasure of hosting some of the Coast Best photographers last Saturday at my, my place in Anchor Bay, Ron Bolander and Craig Tooley, Roseanne Raposo and Gail Jackson, no relation, but was, I was meeting Gail for the first time. And they were here for nearly four hours and they photographed the violet green swallows. And Roseanne said, for the first time, I managed to get a photo of a swallow taking a fecal sack out of the nest. (laughs) (laughs) And it's kind of amazing when I look at her photo, I mean, I've seen that they have little something white in their beaks as they leave occasionally, but it is a little sack. And and it's just, uh, I don't quite know how that all works, but uh, they're, they're cleaning up the nest as they go in to feed and they take out the waste as they leave. Mm-hmm. Um, unlike the other swallows, there's no mess under the, the bird nest. So the violet greens uh, take the waste away. Same with the pygmies and I'm, uh, the pygmy nuthatches. I'm also watching them now taking out nesting material, a few of them, not all of them, 
but I see them removing things from the nest. So they're obviously cleaning it maybe for use for next year. Keeping a clean house. You got all those babies, you know, <laughs> want to keep it right. Everything. You know, uh, I sent you a picture of, um, was it urchins? Yes. A sea anemones. Sea anemones. And, uh, uh, there were at super minus tide at Cook's Beach and Pat uh, Maxwell and uh, Roger and Susan and I were walking there. And so, Pat, I showed her those and I took my picture and walked away. And as she turned around to take a picture, it pooped. I saw she, showed, she sent me that picture. You the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Everything, you know, food goes in, food comes out, whatever you right. are. So. I know Pat. Pat told me she thought she disturbed it. Maybe it was doing it on purpose. I don't think so. But <laughs> I did want to talk about the um, sea anemones and what you saw. But before we get to that, I yes. want to tell you about this bird that uh, Ron photographed down at Stoneboro Road. And it was an olive-sided flycatcher. And they're summer breeders here. They're very um, uncommon to rare. And they arrive at the end of April and they leave by the, um, by the 1st of September. And they depend on dead trees, snags for standing snags for their nest. So our aging pines, as much as we look at them and shake our head and say, isn't that terrible? Um, the flycatchers and other woodpeckers use them for nest. So I just thought that was interesting. And this uh, ornithologist that um, took a look at, at uh, Ron's photo for me, Tim, uh, can't bring in his last name at the moment, he said his, their calls of these flycatchers sound like quick free beer, quick free beer. <laughs> and Diane, she describes this as quick three beers, quick three beers. So when you mention that about the calls, it, you're right on. It's so subjective. <laughs> oh, funny. That's very funny. So getting back to the sea anemones and what, what you saw and you photographed is, is kind of unusual to see because they were hanging down. They weren't in their normal, as you think of them when you see them in tide pools, but because we had the super moon on last Wednesday, by the way, Roseanne got a beautiful photo of it. I think it's going to be on page one of the ICO today of the super moon rising um, about 9.30 at night, just gorgeous. What you saw because of the minus tide, there was no water for the sea anemones and they had lost their hydrostatic seawater pressure. They had deflated. They were just deflated, hanging there. And that's what you yeah. saw. Well, yeah, because it felt like they were or looked like they were reaching for the water, you know, uh -huh. yeah, uh, because of that super minus tide. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I'd yeah. never seen that before. Hydrostatic seawater pressure is what, what they normally are surviving in. So obviously they're made to survive the, the minus tides, but uh, quite an unusual sight. So, oh, I meant to say happy summer because since the time we met last, we've had the summer solstice and we are now officially in summer. That's why some of us have our down jackets. In our <laughs> <laughs> but the first day of summer, we actually had a heat wave, a two day heat wave. It was quite hot. And then on the 4th of July, that Monday, we had rain. Do you remember we had nearly a in half inch of rain wonderful. on? And that's when we'd mentioned Pat Maxwell with the minus tide. Well, she and her visiting daughter, Lauren Hall, went out to Anchor Bay Beach that day. This is a holiday, but it was raining. There was nobody else on Anchor Bay Beach. They had it all to themselves. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's, they, that sounds, maybe that doesn't sound very nice, but it's nice to have a beach to yourself. I totally agree. It just sounds like paradise. You know, it doesn't happen very often, especially not on a holiday. Yeah. Um, and then they saw a pod of dolphins and they only had their um, phone cameras, but it was enough for our friend Scott Mercer to be able to determine that they saw bottlenose dolphins. So that was really nice to hear. They, they stayed around for quite a, a while and were feeding. And by the way, hi, Scott and Tree, we miss you here. Come back home. Come back I'm home where it's nice and cozy right now. Hey, I need to remind people, Jeannie, that they are listening to Jeannie Jackson of Mendenoma Sightings, whose art, uh, fresh article comes out every Thursday in the ICO. So there'll be a new one out. And the third Thursday of every month on Peggy's Place, she's here live and giving us more information about things that we she sees and other people 
send her pictures and stories of flowers. Yeah, it's, a, it's a wonderful gig. I just, uh, I, it's kind of amazing how it started out just with my desire to want to share a sighting of a whale or, or whatever. But now I, I get, I get something every day in my inbox, some things every day in my inbox, people asking me questions and some many times I don't know. So I'm sending out their photos and their questions to the experts that are so generous with their time and expertise. And then I get to learn, which is really fun. So it's, it's a really fun thing that we're doing here. And you're part of it. Susan's part of it. And it's great. It is great. So much fun. Yeah. I'm still waiting to find out about that blue spider. But blue spider. Blue-legged spider. Okay. Maybe that might have that might have gone off my radar, Peggy. Better, well, better resend it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Add it to the spider file. Tom Tom Murphy had a nice sighting of a red-shouldered hawk at his home in Wallala. And my sister Linda Bostrick and I were at RCMS, I guess two weeks ago. We were getting our second booster shot. And so behind the RCMS building. Um, there's that big field where the helicopter lands that, uh, and that, and then the field is quite large and on all other sides, three sides, it's framed by trees. And there was a family of red shouldered hawks in there. So if somebody would like to see and hear red shouldered hawks, they are hanging out. I think they have a nest in that area and they have a really distinctive call for which I'm not going to try to to duplicate it for you, Peggy, because it would be a joke. Uh, and then, um, so that's a fun, fun thing that we have right here. And red-shouldered hawks are, are called hawks of tall trees and water. Well, we have both of those in abundance here. So we've got what they want, location, location, location. Um, the, the, we know that we have Western gulls that nest here. That the, Of all the gull species, the only one that nests here are the Western gulls, the white and gray ones. And uh, Mark Hancock noticed that one was making a nest out at the bluffs at the Point Arena Lighthouse, right on the edge of the, the Devil's Punch Bowl. And he sent a photo and sure enough, there she is sitting on, it's not much of a nest, but in a very protected there. So hopefully she'll be successful. And he said, it's the first time he's seen a Western gull nest at that location. I was shown some years ago, this island just off of the Sea Ranch, a rocky island that is a nesting place for what, have you seen it, Peggy, for Western gulls? I, I know about it. I've never been out there, but yeah. yeah. It's more the Southern end, if I'm remembering correctly of the Sea Ranch, but I just remember coming coming down this bluff area and and coming out to the ocean and seeing this island it was so serene and there were dozens and dozens of western gulls nesting there and it was so quiet and beautiful it was really special to be able to see that oh yeah nice so gray foxes we talked last time that we had just seen the first kits first kits were being born and now of course they're growing up and uh, a new contributor sent in a sighting a couple of days ago. Billy Riggs is his name. And he and his family saw a family of foxes up on their neighbor's roof. Now, that's something you don't see very often. And <laughs> one of the, yeah, I mean, we know they're good climbers. I mean, they, they are great did climbers. Is by a tree or something? Or right. I, I don't know. It didn't show, didn't show enough for me to see that other than to see the foxes on the, the roof was quite steep as uh, some of the sea ranch houses are. And one of the uh, younger foxes was at the apex at the peak of, of one of the roofs. So um, yeah, it was, it was fun to see, fun to see that and fun to observe. I, I was forwarded. I'm not a sea rancher. I live in Anchor Bay as you do, but I have a friend who sometimes forwards me posts from the sea ranch listserv they can be quite amusing <laughs> at times. And this one person said, um, you know, in essence, he didn't say help, but he said, there are uh, gray foxes and they've upturned a flower pot in and, and my, and my, and my garden. What should I do? And I'm thinking, enjoy. <laughs> Just sit back and enjoy the show. I'm jealous. <laughs> Oh. exactly what else are you going to do give them some more flower pots <laughs> <laughs> pick the flower pot up when they're they're not going to be there for very long i'm sure they've left 
So there was a family that also uh, made a home at the Point Rita Lighthouse for the second year in a row. And it just the whole staff at the lighthouse just was enchanted. And uh, Mark told me that the, 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 their dog there, the, the lighthouse dog, remember her name, Peggy? Mina. I, no, that's yes. the cat. No, oh, Mina, okay. You mean Mark's dog? Mark's dog. I want to say Tally, but I don't think that's right. Tussie. Something like something Tussie. like Yes, Tossie. Um, she was fascinated by the fox kits because they would play outside. Uh, they would come out from underneath the building that their their den was under and play in the, the grass. And the dog would not bother them at all, just looked at them and, and watched them and, and as if in wonder. So pretty, pretty great. Yeah, yeah. because Tossie is a huge dog for our listeners who don't know that she's yeah. a big white dog, gigantic, mm-hmm. but but gentle. Oh yeah, she's a love bug. I love her. Uh, Amy Rug was at the hot spot at Sea Ranch, and this is this uh, part uh, land that the Sea Ranch has that connects to the Wallala River, and so they call it the hot spot because it's in the sun. And she, when she was there, she saw hundreds of what she described as teeny tiny fish, hundreds of them. And I sent her photos uh, to Peter Bay, and he said those are recently emerged Wallala roach. And that's the endemic minnow that's only found in the Wallala River. So we were all glad to see that there was such a big hatch. And um, Amy was really glad to know that uh, that that they, they were doing so well. We had such a tough year last year with the drought and the, the river actually dewatered in places, went dry. And we just didn't know how that was going to affect some of the native species. Uh, would they be impacted severely or would they recover? And so this was good news. This was good news for that minnow found nowhere else in the world. Nowhere else in the world. Wow. Nowhere else. Who Endemic. knows? It is about that, you know, that that makes things like that happen. It's time for me to remind you also that you were tuned to KGUA in Gualala, 88.3 FM, or you might be listening on our uh, at KGUA.org. And we have an Air Pocket app, which you can download and take us everywhere so that you can listen to Jeannie Jackson talking about all the nature sightings around here, because it just enriches your life to know what is flying or crawling on the trees or on the ground or making those noises, you know, Mm -hmm. out in the ocean as well, everything, everything. And it is, you know, summer, it's wonderful to know because a lot of things are out enjoying the air. Well, there's a lot of new life. And I, I know that no matter where you are, if you're in a big city, you can still see nature. You, you can get out and the bird, there'll be birds there. There'll be things if you just look, you know, and pay attention. But we are particularly fortunate here because we also have a front row seat for the ocean. So um, we've got a lot of ha- different habitats here and it is a nature wonderland. It truly is. Um, I wanted to bring up a, a butterfly that I love seeing every year, and they're called pine white butterflies. They can be seen now. I saw one uh, land on a flower yesterday. They're small and white with black markings. Their, their wings are etched with, I thought it was dark blue, but the reference says it's black. Um, anyway, they the female lays her eggs on a pine needle in a straight row, as straight as can be. It's just amazing to see it. And then in the the late spring or early summer, they will hatch and they will oftentimes be flying, flitting around the upper branches of pine trees and firs. I've seen them around firs too. So they're wonderful to notice right now. They're not as flashy as say the monarchs of which I got my first sighting this week of a monarch butterfly. Michael Reinhardt got it. Uh, so hopefully we'll see many more. Hopefully they'll have a good year this year. Um, don't confuse the pine whites with the non-native cabbage butterflies. Uh, the cabbage butterflies are all white. Actually, they're kind of a, a little pale, yellow. pale yellow, you know, rather than the white that these pine whites are. And I, I know that the cabbage butterflies are a tremendous pest to agriculture and to those of us who like to grow lettuce and other crops because I had this happen once where a cabbage butterfly laid her eggs in my 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 box it was full of wonderful lettuce 
And when they hatch, they're like little maggots. They look like little maggots. I didn't know what they were. And they're voracious. And within two days, my lettuce was gone. Oh just my. totally gone. Yeah. Wow. Anyway. So I, I want to ask you back to the, um, the other uh, butterflies. Um, how large are they? The pine whites? I would say they're fully, were their wings fully extended? Maybe three quarters of an inch. Okay, so, so they're, they're still smaller than a monarch, but oh, much smaller. The, about the same size as the cabbage. Maybe, thing. maybe about the same size as the cabbage. Maybe just a hair um, smaller. Okay. So uh, yeah, and I've I've been seeing swallowtails, and um, when the the day warms up, when the fog pulls, and by the way, the fog is pulled back over the ocean now, so your house is going to definitely be in sun. Yay! Yay! <laughs> a little sunshine out here now. Yeah, there you go. We have proof from two locations, Walala and Anchor Bay. We're Zooming today. We're on Zoom. I did want to mention this. One of the cutest photos I've seen in a long time was taken by Eric Setterholm of a baby brush rabbit. So that's the smaller, the little cottontail and a uh, male California quail. And he's, he, he and Amy Rue live on the Sea Ranch. And they say that there's a neighbor's drive or walkway that wildlife, in particular, the rabbits and the deer seem to like to traverse. So he's able to see a lot of sightings there, but to see a baby brush rabbit, I mean, I, I always said that the fox kits are the cutest babies on the coast. I think I might have to revise that. I think the brush rabbit babies are, are the cutest now, but he got a photo of the baby with a um, with the father quail in the background. And I probably got the most response from that photo of any that I've ever done in doing my column. In fact, Lena Bullimore actually cut out the picture that was in the ICO, pasted it on a postcard and sent me a, a thank you. Oh, <laughs> and, and she even had bunny stamps. She was able to buy stamps with bunnies on them. Oh, it was really a really nice hello, a really nice thank you. But like, thanks to Eric. How small was that that uh, baby bunny? Because oh, I well, if you, you, you know the size. Sorry, <laughs> you know the size of a quail because we yeah. see them. We're seeing them quite a bit right now. Um, I would say it was a about half the size, a, about half the height, and maybe a little bit uh, wider. I'll have to take a another look at that. But it's uh, a baby quail when you see them walking with their babies. Right. I think it would be bigger than a baby quail. Yeah, because I don't think the brush rabbits come out when they're just newborn. The the mother, you know, hides them uh, away in in holes in the in the earth. So uh, to me, it's unusual and wonderful to see a young brush rabbit because normally I would only see them once they were big enough not to be able to tell. Mm -hmm. you know? So because they're everywhere. they're very much uh, preyed upon by other animals, so the mother has to be uh, uh, extra careful. So it was a pretty special photo that he got. I have a mountain lion sighting for you, Peggy, and it's a pretty darn good one. Okay. And we're our friends, John and Susan Sandoval, who live in Wallala, close to the Arts Center on off Old Stage Road. Last Thursday, they heard something on their deck about 830 in the evening. Oh. And she had her, she, I think she had her iPad with her and she got a beautiful photo of a mountain lion. I sent it to Quentin Martins, the expert, and he got back to me. He was so excited. He used four exclamation marks after one comment. He said, it's a young adult female. And he was so taken by the photo. He asked if he could use it on his website and Susan gave permission. So that will be in today's ICO. Now I was curious because often other sightings, I wouldn't say that we have often, we have sightings of mountain lions that often, but the times that we do have them when they're close to a house, there's usually pets inside. I remember Cece Case had the one where the mountain lion looked through her window and mm -hmm. she was sitting at her desk and looked up and there, there's this mountain lion looking back at her. And she figured the mountain lion was attracted by her cats. But the Sandovals don't have pets. They don't have domestic or farm animals there. So what drew it to their deck? I, I don't know. Just mm -hmm. very interesting to me. And then we've had several 
wildlife cameras as, as they proliferate and uh, we, we're starting to get some a really good look at what's out and about at night with the infrared uh, cameras. And Joni Goshorn up in Point Arena got a mountain lion and her um, camera. And they do have uh, farm animals, they have chickens. And they, so obviously that would draw a mountain lion or a bobcat. We know bobcats love them, love to eat chickens. But they, Joni and her partner have protected their chickens with a motion activated sprinkler system. And I thought that was brilliant because that is a way to scare wildlife away. So you, obviously you need to protect them with their, the cages that they're in at night. And this was point. around midnight when the mountain lion came. Wet or they just get surprised when? I think they get surprised. I, they may get wet, but I think it's the shock mm -hmm. of it, the sudden motion, the sound and the wet, the whole, the whole package. Interesting. I, I, years ago, someone was complaining about either raccoons or skunks coming on their deck and kind of making a mess. And I suggested at the time putting something like that on their deck and it took care of the problem. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it doesn't hurt the animal. We don't want to hurt them. Uh, it's, their, it's their home too. So um, the other mountain lion, uh, um, there's two other mountain lion signs I wanted to tell you about. One, Eric, um, Liam Erickson was hiking on the wheat field fork of the Wallala River with Peter Bay and Peter Bay's dog. And the, a mountain lion came down to drink in the river. And Peter, uh, Liam had, had, uh, had alerted them to the fact because Peter was concerned about his dog and he immediately just yelled for his dog that scared the mountain lion away and uh -huh. Peter Peter kind of felt bad that he didn't let the mountain lion get a drink of water so um and then the other sighting was by Carl Romick R-O-M-I-C-K his camera found a big mountain lion walking up a trail at 9 50 so 10 minutes to 10 in the morning and it's surprising to me because mountain lions are nocturnal. So what was this big cat doing out at that time of the morning? It's about three quarters of a mile from the coast on Schooner Gulch Road. When so was those this? Are my, yeah. Do you know when that was? It was within the last month, okay. probably, two, probably two weeks ago, two or, two or three weeks ago. Yeah. So also Joni's camera has shown bobcats and and deers with fawns gray foxes skunks she got one video which i, I plan on sharing on my website of a uh, i think it was a gray fox and a skunk that were playing with each other <laughs> yeah it's, it's cute careful. really cute <laughs> the fox was being careful yes uh, i'm sure we're all careful right. with, with, with it must skunks. have been young oh yeah so uh, Paul and Jackie Brewer do something that I think is really wonderful. They take drives to go see wildlife at different areas of the coast. And this particular day, they, they went to Manchester. I think they drove up Mountain View Road and they found one of our native thistles. So right off the bat, I'm thinking, wow, we have a native thistle here. Well, we have more than one. We've got uh, three, I believe, three or four. And this one is beautiful. It's um, called, let's see, it's called Venus thistle. And it's a, a dark pink to red color. And I wanted to bring it up because we know we have the, the terrible non-native thistle here. It's all over California. It's called um, yellow star thistle. It's prickly, it's invasive. It's not good for wildlife. Uh, and so a lot of people pull it up but I think it's important for people then to learn what the native thistles are. So you don't want to be pulling those up because they do feel, they do feed wildlife. And there is another, um, uh, Peter told me that that Venus thistle is an inland thistle. So they probably saw it maybe some miles up Mountain View Road, but there is a thistle that we see here and it's called, it's kind of hard to say thistle, you know, it's <laughs> called a, a Western thistle or also cobwebby thistle. And it's a pink lavender color, quite beautiful. And then there's also a very low growing thistle that I've seen at the Stornetta Lands called brown or brownie thistle. It's a, a low growing plant. So interesting to learn. Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna have to look up that lavender one. Um, I'm wondering if that's what we have. Could be, could be. Outside uh, in, in one area. Yeah, uh -huh. be. That, that'd be great. 
Craig uh, Ward found our native rose. There's a non-native rose that also blooms here called uh, egg, eglantin, if I'm pronouncing it right, eglantine maybe, eglantine rose. That's the non-native. They're both pink and they're kind of hard to tell apart. But when Peter looked at Greg's photo, he thought that it was the Nootka rose, N-O-O-T-K-A. That's our native wild rose. They're both um, equally beautiful, that, that and the non-native. And uh, the non-native is not invasive. So um, we, we're, we're okay with it being here, right? Right. Um, Gina Davis had some rare plants come up at her property up on the Wallala Ridge, um, gnome plants. And this year, there are very few parasitic plants that came up because I have quite a few of them on ricks in my property and a neighboring property has them sugar sticks, gnome plants, and the very rare small ground cones. And this year, because I think because of the way the rains came, they came in deluges, and then we had two months of the winter with practically no rain at all. They weren't happy with the conditions and they did not come up. Hmm. So on my property, no known plants, no sugar sticks, and no ground cones. And on my neighbors, maybe three sugar sticks where they normally have dozens, no um, ground cones. So I was glad to see that Gina had some known plants come up on her property. That was, that was good, good news to see. Yeah. And hopefully they'll all be back next year. This is the first time they haven't come up on my property. So um, I'm really interested to see what's going to happen to be determined. I have a question about the thistles. Sorry to go back to thistles. When we lived in Bodega Bay, we had a thistle, but it was it be, they became artichokes. Now, it, or do all, all thistles do that? And it was, you know, or is that just a special thistle? And I don't, you know, this place we rented had a pretty nice garden, but uh, uh, we had I don't know. in the garden. I do not know. I'll have to, I'll have to do some research. I, I didn't know we had native thistles. So that's how little I know about them. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, all I know is that they were there and we had artichokes because we like artichokes. You know, and, and to say that the non-native thistles um, actually do feed the American goldfinches, we've seen them feeding on them. So it's not an all bad plant. It's just so invasive. It's like the Scotch broom. It just takes over and crowds out the native plants. And that's why it's such a, such a problem. If it would, as with the, the non-native rose here, it doesn't crowd out the native rose. So we, it's okay. We can, we can handle it. Um, so that's the problem with that yellow thistle. I don't know about the, the artichokes, the, art, the edible artichokes, because my sister grows them in Point Arena, um, probably are in the same family, probably in the thistle family. Yeah, yeah. definitely a thistle. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We have, uh, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> we have a, a rare plant that grows in Sonoma and Mendocino County called the Coast Lily. They're the orange uh, lilies that are on tall slender stems. And there's a wonderful patch of them down by Salt Point State Park on the east side of Highway 1. Well, unfortunately, Caltrans mowed them down this year, this uh, maybe three weeks ago. And we were, a lot of us were upset about that. Amy Rube was the one that notified me of it. And they grow on, not on bulbs, but, but rhizomes. And they need their full production of leaves and flowers to feed the, the, their future growth. So when they get mowed down, they're denied that uh, the sugars that they can make from the sun. So Peter Bay being the botanist that he is, he got right on it and called Caltrans and was able to get two people to respond and that were concerned about it and hopefully they will change their practices. Peter said either mow early in the spring before they're up or in the fall. And I think that one patch maybe could be protected for this rare endemic plant only found in, in our two counties. Wow, what a great idea. I'm glad yeah. it's called. And I've yeah. heard people complain about that happened. Yeah, it's a, it's a real, tra real tragedy and it's so, they don't know, you know, they're, just, they're in a machine that they're just cutting everything down for, for fire safety. And I understand that. So uh, we'll, we'll try to try to get those beauties protected. Uh, they, there are a few coast lilies on the road where I live. They grow by my neighbor, Alyssa Edwards Springbok. So they grow in 
marshy um, wetlands type um, areas. And the other um, beautiful wildflower that's blooming now are leopard lilies. I'm not seeing them very much, but um, Chris um, Peckle got a really nice photo of one and they've got spots on them. They're similar to the coast lilies, but they've got spots. And one of the uh, myths about leopard lilies, if you sniff them, you'll get freckles. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great cute. Yeah. And then I got some, uh, some photos texted to me yesterday by Catherine Miller, who was out with a friend at the Stornetta Lands. And then I believe at Pelican Bluffs, which has similar type uh, wildflowers. And she photographed coyote mint and a real pretty bloom. And I wasn't familiar with it. So it was fun to learn that. And then she, she had a, 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 a purple blue flower that I thought was the ethereal spear, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but it turned out to be a much rarer plant, King's gentian. So they're one of the few blue wildflowers that we have. And I know that there's a patch on the Stornetta lands. It's being kept secret because they, we don't want anyone to try to dig them up. And you'd kill them if you did. Um, and then uh, Catherine has found another patch, apparently. So the people who care about the wildflowers will probably go out and check that particular patch. So it's good news. Yeah. And Catherine was really pleased. They both have interesting names. The Don't they, though? Ethereal Spear and or, and the other one was the King's King's Gentian Gentian huh. Gentian G E N T I A N. There's probably some good stories about the common names, and uh, would be fun to look them up. Um, so uh, here, Judith Fisher really enjoys walking at Willow Point Regional Park, as do you and I, and many others. But she found a disturbing sighting there: a uh, poison hemlock, and it was close to the visitor center. Hmm. And I have seen poison hemlock along the uh, the trail out to Schooner Gulch uh, Beach. So it's here and it's a very nasty, non-native, toxic plant, toxic to humans, toxic to animals. And so she talked to the staff at the park and they were already aware of it and we're going to take steps to remove it. Um, it's not easy. Uh, you have to wear gloves. You have to be really careful. All parts of the plant are toxic to people people and animals, including the dead canes. The dead mm -hmm. canes can be toxic for three years, just oh. lying there on the ground. So to, to recognize this plant, look for reddish or purplish spots on the stems and the stems are hollow. And their tiny white flowers are in clusters at the end of their stems and the stems branch and the clusters are in the shape of an umbrella and you definitely need gloves to remove them, so. Oh my goodness, had no idea. I uh, know. Now I'm gonna look them up just to be safe. And so just touching them will harm you. It's, it's, it's a really bad plant. You don't wanna to touch it with your bare skin. And uh, yeah, it's, it, we need, we really, we need some kind of work party to get rid of them. It, with it, being on the state parks, you'd think we could get something arranged and, and have, people protect it and get rid of them and, and stop this. So if it's starting to spread and that's what these invasive plants do, these non-natives, they're, they're good competitors. And now we find one at Willala Point Park. I've never heard of one at Willala Point Park. I have heard of the non-native thistle there, but not uh, poison hemlock. Okay, thank well. you. Uh, just to little, do a little timekeeping. We got about mm, six minutes, seven, no less, a little bit less. Yep. I have 40 minutes more at least. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just going to have to go two hours in one of these days. Oh, I my gosh. I it. wanted to tell you about a photo that Michelle Melio got, M-E-L-I-O, if I'm pronouncing it right. She has a really good eye for nature, and I love the photos that she sends me. She photographed one of our native bumblebees from behind in the air, <laughs> flying. I don't know how she, that's really great to be able to do that, to catch a bee flying. But from behind, it showed the pollen packs on its rear, its hind legs. And they look like two little orange suitcases. There was so much pollen packed in there. And I, I just was charmed by it. And it, they were um, yellow-faced bumblebees. That's our most common bumblebee. So um, that was pretty, pretty cool to be able to see that. Summer is also known for dragonflies. And they are here in abundance now. Now that Bower Park is reopened, 
Um, the, the lake at Bower Park is a premium place to see it. You need to wait until the sun is out. So a foggy morning, you're not gonna see dragonflies, but um, Terry Fardresher has a pond on her property and that group of photographers that came to my place last Saturday, they were at her pond the Saturday before and they got some beautiful uh, photos of dragonflies there. One was the, the more common orange one that we see, a flame skimmer, but a blue-eyed darner was another one. And one I'm still waiting to get ID'd from my expert. I'm not sure. It's a, a, almost a metallic gray color that, that Craig Tooley caught. So it'll be fun to see. And we talked about the, the young peregrine falcons out at Wallala Point Park and their flying lessons. We haven't been seeing the bald eagles in their normal spot at the Wallala River, but I have had sightings of them by the Badaja, the Garcia, recently. And I think the one photo that I got from Sarah Bogard is the female that we normally see at the Wallala because there are some dark feathers in her head. And she has always sported some, normally their heads are completely white when they're adults. Uh, we did not see a young one this year. And I were wondering if maybe the peregrines being so present at the mouth of the Wallala River has caused the bald eagles just to go elsewhere. I don't know. I don't know. It could also be food. Maybe they've overfished the Wallala River and they need to do fishing in the Padaha for a while. That could, it could be both. It could be both. So um, I was glad to see that there were some uh, sightings of them just to our north. Craig Tooley photographed a barred owl. And this is the owl that was normally considered a, a Northeastern owl. It's abundant there, but it's slowly been expanding across the United States and has now reached our shores. And they look similar to the uh, endangered spotted owl. They're more aggressive than the spotted owl and they seem to be displacing the spotted owl. Spotted owls were already in trouble because we keep logging the old growth redwood trees that they need for their homes. And um, so anyway, they're very cute and they have a very unique call. And this call is described as who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Well, I listened to it yesterday and it's like this. Who, 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 who. <laughs> I think I've heard that. Yeah. That's yeah. the call or something similar. You can do a better job by going on the Cornell Lab of Ornithology site. Pretty you can good. listen to all kinds of birds there. <laughs> and, and anyway, when Craig was taking the photo, the, the little owl was perched just perfectly on a branch. And as Craig is clicking away, here comes a stellar jay with its feathers and its, its wings extended and its, its, its uh, feet in the little attack mode. It was going to attack that owl. So Craig says, I've been photobombed by a J and he got the photo. It's a great photo. I bet. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Black oyster catchers have been seen with their little chicks. We talked about the quail. I, I have a family of quail here. My neighbor Karen mentioned it when we took a walk yesterday, seeing the little ones and um, it's fun to see them and, and hear the adults making their calls. And, uh, American white pelicans have arrived at the Russian river. You probably saw them when you lived down there. Um, they nest inland. We rarely see them on this part of the coast, but they do come here. Pardon? The times we've been driving to Santa Rosa the past couple of weeks, they're there, but there seem to be less. Uh, Paul Brewer found them uh, at further up the river. He found a site and he found dozens and dozens of them. It was beautiful to see. So I'm sure that they move up and down the river and that maybe not in spots that we can see from the road. So uh, and then, so that's fun to see. I have seen an American white pelican here, but it's very rare that they would fly up this far north. But mm -hmm. maybe this year, who knows? Beautiful yeah. to see. And Diane pointed out, they hunt very differently from the brown pelicans. Brown pelicans, which we are privileged to see migrating northward and then southward, um, plunge dive for their fish. It's quite dramatic. And, and the American white pelicans, they bob on the water and they duck down their heads to get their the fish. So it's a totally different way. There's a hurt deer at the Sea Ranch. She broke her leg a couple of years ago, but she's managed to survive and thrive. And Monica Martinez sent me a photo and she said for the second year in a row, this deer with the hurt leg has had a set of twins. And it was just, a, she, she calls that deer an inspiration 
to how she cares for her fawns, even though it's difficult for her. And I just thought it would, would be maybe a good thought to end our discussion today with a deer that is so inspiring. I love that. Well, I, I had one other quick uh, inspirational thought. I want, wanted to give a shout out to a uh, uh, party, the Bouvier yes, that yes. survived a, a week in uh, Fish Rock, uh, Gulch in between where we live, it seems like. And uh, I kind of, you know, she was bred for hunting. So I kind of thought she might have lived on some of those bush bunnies that were out might there, have. you she know, and uh, they're so fast. Uh, they actually can run at 35 miles an hour. So once I learned that, I wasn't too worried about the lions getting her. So <laughs> I was more worried all. about I was more worried about Tammy Roseberry, who was so upset about her getting loose. And so I'm so happy for Tammy's sake that the party's back. I'd like to give a shout out to my brother-in-law, Mel Smith, who is having surgery this morning. And may it be successful and you'd be back watching for whales and, and birds and so on at your home in Point Arena. Thank you for both of those. Thank you to Tammy. And, and yeah, big shout out to Mel. We got to go. Uh, this has been Mendenoma Sightings, and we'll repeat it at one o'clock. This is KGUA. I got to run to Albuquerque. And then um, I, I've got a special phone call. I get to talk to W. Kama Bell this morning. Wow. So I got to get ready for that. All, All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye, Judy. Peggy. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. And away we go to uh and give your puppy 